sleep. All right. Everyone awake? Yes? Okay, that's not working. Okay. Who am I? Why am I here? Uh, none of you know me, but I do a lot of presentations for open source uh, and open hardware stuff. Day job, I work on supercomputers, moving on to quantum. Uh, to show you my dedication, we are now, uh, I'm part of the uh, Coral Delivery, which is America's supercomputer. We're going to be finishing up tomorrow, so I'm driving back. Um, it's my day job, it's boring. <laughs> the cool part is what I do in my spare time is I like to hack on radios, everyone here, RF. Uh, MMDVM, which is the, the uh, which stands for uh, multi-mode digital voice. Uh, I forgot what that last name stands for. But uh, that board, at the core of it, is the uh, STM32F103. This, yeah, this is getting boring. It's going to put you to sleep. I know. So, I want to show you this board. Where This is where it comes in, where my linkage is into open hardware. I didn't write this board, but this board is open hardware, open software. If you look on GitHub under MMDVMHS, dual, you'll find this. It goes for 50 bucks. Uh, you might recognize there's this company called Analog Devices. Anyone here heard of Analog Devices? That's uh, the SDR that does the narrowband digital. So there's two of them, one for transmit, one for receive. And the modem part is the Cortex M3, the uh, STM32F103, that's a mouthful. I play around with the firmware that goes on there. That's what I, that my hobby. Um, uh, so what I want to say here, just as an aside real quick, to insert it is, uh, what got me passionate about the open hardware uh, movement was a lot of people in, this is, a, this, uh, I should have said that, this is ham radio. So what the multimedia digital uh, modem board does, it allows you to take uh, your portable, your handheld, these walkie talkies, things like this, everyone has seen, like, right? This is a ham radio, this is a DMR radio. Uh, this board also does support, you see on there, P25 and NXDN. Those are used in police force, fire, rescue, federal level. Um, those are on their uh, frequencies, but they can be moved back down to the ham bands, and that's what we play with, is moving this stuff and getting it to work and talking to people all over the world. That's what excites us. This board came on the market, and what it did is it flooded the market. Everyone was getting them. People were saying, don't get it. It's, it this open thing is wrong. You've got to do proprietary. You've got to do close. It has to be in a sealed box. And this thing flooded the market. And what it did when it flooded the market, it, it raised all the bumps. It made the need for really good design engineered hardware more valuable. So instead of people just selling one or two of their special versions, they're selling 50 or 100. So it actually created a market because, again, this board is used for people to talk, to communicate to other people. So the more that are out there, the more interesting it is and the more demand it was driving. So I got really upset that these people were bad-mouthing open hardware, and that's why I'm, another reason why I'm here today. The other thing is I told you I do a lot. Um, if you want to take a picture, if you're ever in the Hudson Valley, we have a lot of really great, I'm from the Hudson Valley, New York. Uh, we have a lot of great open clubs. We have a lot of clubs. I'm part of HV Open, which is the open source. Uh, we also have a great maker space, which is SquidWrench. We also have startup support, which is uh, HV Tech, and now HVDN. But 10 years ago, I started this thing called the Mad Science Fair. And that's where adults got to create science projects that have to do with software and hardware, bring it in, demonstrate to the community, to kids. We get about 30, 40 people in. It's, it's really great. It's been going 10 years. Uh, Sophie Kravis is here from Hackaday. She's always helped me. She's been there like the first two, at least the second one. Um, I also like to thank um, a lot of people. Bob uh, Demkowitz is out there. He always supported me with that. And uh, Steve is out there. Steve, say hello to everyone. If you ever need engineering on uh, digital, uh, actually anything to do with uh, RF, he's, he's the guy to definitely talk to. 
um, MicroPython. I was going to get slide MicroPython. What I get is I can change the slide the last minute. Okay, everyone, you got a bad, right? This is actually running MicroPython, and one of my talk is the STM, um, not the STM, the ESP32. Now, if you hold down the little A button for a while, not, you don't have to do it now, you'll get a menu. One of the menu uh, pieces is REPL, which is REPL. It's the Python command prompt. What this slide was supposed to say, I was going to tell you about how with Arduino, you're doing in C code, you're, you're compiling, you're deploying it onto the chip. But with MicroPython, you have that interactive prompt. So you can get the interactive prompt on your own badge. You just have to solder a header, this little serial header. If you solder that in and then connect it to a computer and put this in REPL mode, you'll be able to get the interactive prompt. That's, I'm pretty sure that will happen. I haven't hacked it yet. I haven't had one of these, but I will definitely get back to you on that. So, MicroPython, it's great, better than sliced bread. What's the hardware? Uh, what hardware does it run on? Well, two real main uh, types of hardware. You have the ARM Cortex M4, which is what I was working, what I work on with the uh, with that modem board, the, the STM32 F405, which is the latest. It's it's the more powerful. The problem with that chip, well, not really the problem, but it depends what you need, what the project is. That's a really great chip for performance. It also has, when you connect it via its USB connector, it mounts its internal memory as a thumb drive. So you can move files back and forth, but it doesn't have any RF. There's no Wi-Fi, there's no Bluetooth. What, we're, what I'm talking about today is the ESP side of the house, which is the ESP3266, that's the People are probably familiar with that. It's like a buck, two bucks now. Uh, the ESP32, which is on your car, that's what I'm talking about. That's the uh, better one of the, well, I, I like it more. It has the Wi-Fi, it has the Bluetooth. It has more power, and it's also dual core. There's two cores on there. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and I got, I got ahead of myself here. So, again, you don't want to overbuy. You have a project. If, if you're working with uh, high school kids or college kids, you want to do the introductory. You want to get that LED blinking within the first five seconds or five minutes of, of you know, you're showing them Python. You don't need necessarily the ESP32. 32 is a really good for a sustained project, something you're trying to solve, uh, working with a team. The ESP, uh, the, the 8266 is still a great chip, but it's really a great chip for something that's affordable. You're, you're trying to do a lot of them, like temperature sensors, uh, pressure sensors, anything like that. You want to do an array. So really great chips, really have fun time working with it. So what I'm talking about here is a repository on the internet that is a MicroPython, uh, the firmware, at the firmware level that has a, a, what's, what attracted me to it and what's really great for this solution for like the mad science type of solution is it's very easy to compile and deploy. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, the make cycle of it. Unlike the, you know, the, the repository of, of MicroPython is great, but it's really hard to get down from get and understand what you're doing. This simplifies it down to a couple of simple commands. It's also menu driven, so instead of going through H files, because MicroPython, like most stuff, is written in C code or a lot of it, so you don't have to dig through your, your header files, your source code. Um, the important thing is when, when, you're, when you're doing a lot of iterations, right, we want to fail and iterate, fail and iterate, is that you're constantly updating your code. In this case, it would be python.py file. So you have to put it on a file system somewhere. And uh, without that ability to just connect the chip up to your laptop or whatever and, and just move it over there, you need this ability to uh, create your, your Python files and then move it over to the chip and then start it up and, and, and then bring that file up in your interactive um, command to see what's going on. But to move it there without having to set up Wi-Fi, then mount you know, FTP over, this, that would take you uh, way too long. Um, and finally is that since you do have this menu driven system and you can get down into the bowels of the firmware, you can turn on stuff, turn off stuff, um, 
if if you wanted like in our badges if you wanted a web inter interface to say what's your name what's your last name you can turn on that ability if you need that if that's what what you're out to do so uh, Boris is the one who created this. I've, I've emailed him. There's some great resources. There's the GitHub address, of course, I put there. Uh, under the GitHub address, under the wiki part, there's the build instructions. So you can get, you know, go there for documentation. Uh, the two forums, you have Laboris. That's the actual forum for this repo. A lot of people on there. Just ask any questions. It's really great. Um, then the MicroPython forum itself is also where I go for larger you know, okay, so now, now you got his thing going, that's just the, the firmware, but now you have a MicroPython question. There's a lot of support there. Um, so, <laughs> more technical stuff. The big, when I, one, one of the things, if you're going to demonstrate these chips and you have this great stuff and you're handing it out to people and they're connecting it uh, and they're trying to get this to work, the first challenge is these chips usually have a, a USB connection and you connect it to a computer and nothing happens. Um, and with, with the uh, ESP32, if you load this specific driver, because it's, it's the Chinese USB serial interface, which is the CP210X, there's where to go for uh, Windows. The Mac is very easy because it really comes up on the Mac, you plug it in and you just look under your devices and you'll see it. Linux is the same way. Um, the way you talk to it is it's the old-fashioned serial connection. So I reckon I like cool term because it's very robust, you can save everything, you can see your lights whether you have connection or if, if everything's not right. Putty is the old standby for Windows if you didn't weren't uh, aware of that. So let's tempt the demo gods here and see if everyone can see that. Is that mic reading? So um, once you pull down from Git, you'll buried under MicroPython build, there's the build.sh script. Don't worry, I have another slide on that. We're going to do menu config, which is the second part. So if you run menu config, you get a lot of you, if you're Linux people, you'll recognize this from the old days. This is just like the kernel building. Uh, menuing system. So what we can do here, which I think is really cool, is uh, you can turn on all uh, security features. One of the first things you'll do is you'll go into the serial flash config. This is what you have to configure to make sure all the stuff moves stuff back and forth to your the chip you're trying to program. So if you don't get the serial part right, you won't be able to basically do the compile and push to the chip. So that's where you, in these chips, the uh, ESP chips run at 11.52 uh, is their baud rate. Everything else you can leave the same. Those are the two main takeaways from that. You exit to go back. Drill down in the MicroPython. Here's where you can set the name of the board, or time zone, you name it. Everything is in here. You can, I could spend hours. Um, under modules, this is, I think, probably the most, remember I told you you could push and pull, you can, this is where you can say, I want uh, SSA, I want MQTT, part of IOT, I'm working, so this is where you can put the functionality or take it away. Um, last thing I want to get into, uh, some of the uh, STEM, uh, the ESP boards do have an SD card, you can configure that there. Now we're running. Well, so once you make your changes, you would hit save, of course. I'm just going to exit out here, and you're back at your command prompt. So let's go back into the slides. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. So you saw that neat menuing system when you drill down. This is what I needed. If we go down to MicroPython under system settings, if we take the scheduler depth, its default was 8. If you move it to 16, and then you drill down into modules, uh, no, also under system settings, so uh, you would then use both cores. So the underlying part of MicroPython is 
a free RTS, a real-time uh, OS. And Lobo lets you actually do those configurations down at the bowels. So what's the MicroPython's up here, down at the OS le level that's running on the chip, you can actually activate its threading to both of the cores that are on these very inexpensive chips. So once you do that and you recompile and deploy, you'll get a 67% increase in performance. Again, let's move on to, to show you that. Ah, here's, okay, so this is the actual, okay, now I'm interested, Joe, how do you compile and do all these fun things? You, know, you do the clean, we just did, we showed you the make menu config. You would then do just the build minus J, you put the number of cores, on my Mac I have eight cores. If you don't put anything, it will take about uh, four minutes, but if you're like me, I want it done in a couple of seconds, you throw in the number of cores you have. Once you have it compiled, you would then do a space flash, and that's again, you have to have the serial set up and connect it, and that will then move the, uh, the firmware to the chip. It will say, once it's done, it will come back up. It will then tell you it's completed. You can then, then go to your serial terminal, put that in, and then pull up the chip, and you'll get to the REPL on that chip directly. The interesting part also, Lobo, is the other really advantage is the fact that it separates the file system that's on the chip from the firmware. So what you can do is you can do a make FS for file system and then flash FS for, for taking that file system and moving it to the chip as a separate bin file. Let me get to that on another slide. Hold that thought, uh, which is this one. So I know I'm racing through this, but I'm going to right now overtime, well, close to overtime. So under, I'll do another demo here. So in this core directory, I put a link in. So under, under this, buried under this components internal image is the image of the file system. So we can actually go here and this is where you can put your Python files or whatever you want to run on the chip. Again, you're in experimenting mode. You want to diddle uh, I, I, P, uh, I O pins, or you want to look at an analog signal. You can write a Python. Uh, you can write your program, put it here. You'll notice that in this directory is pystone.py. That's the program I'm going to be running to do the measurements, this performance measurements, and how I measured. Um, all I did was put that pystone.py file there, compile the file system, and then deploy it to the chip, and I was able to, to run the, uh, that Python program on the chip itself. So, it's, all, it's always important to measure. What, I'm what this talk is about also is about performance and how you can change your firmware and get squeeze performance out of that really chip cheap chip you got on eBay. So under the MicroPython's forum, I, I saw this, uh, okay, so under MicroPython, someone had created this, uh, a re, uh, they recoded uh, Drystone, named it Pystone, and it's a way of measuring CPU performance. And that's where I got the pystone.py file from. And also under the forums, I saw, that, I saw this post about someone that went out and they started measuring all the chips they had in their inventory. So I said, I gotta do this. I got a couple of chips. I gotta do it with Lobo. I gotta see if I can tweak the, uh, tweak the firmware. So this is how I actually did it. So you'll notice the three uh, greater than symbols, that's the sign of the uh, Python, your interactive shell. You do import pystone because the file name was pystone.py, you do an import. So if you want to import your file, it's just the file without the extension. And then to run it, in this case, it's pystone.main as a function, and then that's how, that would come back to you on the command line. So this is the actual runs that are the basis for that 67.59% increase, just to show you the actual runs themselves. So, everyone loves a good performance chart, right? <laughs> this is an honest performance chart. You'll notice that the prices and the chips are all over the field. 
The one I'm talking about is the ESP32, which is down at the bottom. $8 is really expensive. When I put these prices in, I did it like three nights ago, and they're really, I just went on eBay and saw what I could get. Um, I found it interesting that the Teensy is really, really good with the Pi Stones. Um, the Pi board, that's my measure, the 1.1. Uh, oh, the uh, STEM F405 uh, is the one I have. That's the, I did that measurement myself. That one I got for 16 bucks. It's one of my favorite chips. But again, it has no RF. Go ahead. I'm sorry, the unit, yeah, I came off, you know, came off, Pi Stones, P-Y Stone, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, right here. So, looking at, the, it says Pi Stones per second, it would be Pi Stones per second. So, I don't know if that's like a real unit, that's the unit that this program uses. So, it's relative to each other. Yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how you would translate that into something else. But this is just to show relativity is that um, really what I wanted people to get out of the slide is the fact that performance is just one dimension that may be a factor in your project or your open hardware and that might not be, uh, you might not need it. If I'm blinking an LED for, for a kid, I, it doesn't matter how quickly I can make the LED go on and off except if I want to blink it so many times to have a fit. Um, but, well, you know, I have kids, so you know, sometimes you want to do something like that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting it. I'm not suggesting it at all. Um, but sometimes, okay, so, so the, the, uh, the, the 405 is designed for, like, drones, uh, imaging, like, as a drone is looking for something, you'd want to, you'd use that. Uh, we use it in the radio, in that board is the 103, which we need because we're we're, uh, de we're, we're taking the, the radio signal, stripping off, putting packets on, putting it back on the wire for the internet. Um, so we need performance. It doesn't, um, because that modem, I should have said, it, it goes on top of the Raspberry Pi. We use the RF on the Raspberry Pi since it's a dual circuit, so we don't really need the, the RF uh, of the uh, ES ESP chip. Um, this also shows that prices are all over the field, all over the place, and you know that if you if you standardize in something like Python or uh, that you can uh, have different hardware choices, it, it, you can reuse your code. And um, I can take questions now. If you take a picture of the slide, this is all these slides and the, uh, two bonus ones because I tried to shorten this down. A question, sure. Okay, and generally, right. Generally, things like that were hard. So the question is, have you tried anything the speed from the core out back again? No, but I go to conferences like this to learn so, things I'll, like I'll this. I'll give you so. a benchmark for it, and it's shocking how like a, a, a $1 single-cycle production AVR can go away on Raspberry Pi because of all the overhead to get to the core. Yes, and, and that's a very good point. Is is the, the overhead. So what I'm trying to show here is that if you can manipulate the firmware, the actual micro, what MicroPython's running on, you can keep your code generic in Python, but you can manipulate the hardware at the firmware layer. And you can then adapt because, really because the file system is separate, you can get your firmware just the way you want tweaked to the chip you have and the chip you're deploying, and then you can change your software without having to change the firmware or the MicroPython part of the firmware. Any other? Okay. Yeah.